Good morning. It is 10 o'clock on the dot here on May 20th of 2021. And so I will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the second episode of our new distance learning program called Dig Deeper. This program is designed to connect Indiana students and learners from K-12 classrooms to geological careers and research. Today's program will be recorded, and after the live event is over, I will post the recording on the IGWS Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel and our website. Once I post it on the survey's website, I will also connect it to relevant um, extension materials and Indiana State curriculum standards, okay? If at any point you have questions during this live program, go ahead and add them into the chat and we will make sure that they are answered by the end of the live session today. If you are watching this recording of uh, the program, you can either add your comments in the Facebook page um, of the video, you can add them to the comments of the YouTube page, or you could email us or message us on social media. And we will have all of the links to, to do that at the end of this program. Okay, um, our Dig Deeper webinar series is going to occur on the third Thursday of each month, but we're gonna take a break next month in June for summer break. And we will resume the program in July where we have lots of new speakers and new research topics lined up for the next school year. So this is gonna be our last program for the next two months. And then we will be back on the third Thursday of July. Okay, my name is Polly Sturgeon and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Indiana Geological and Water Survey. Um, I am excited to have several people joining us today and very excited to welcome our guest for today's um, Dig Deeper episode which is Dr. Todd Thompson. Todd is the uh, director of the Indiana Geological and Water Survey and also the state geologist of Indiana. And he's gonna be sharing his exciting research and some of his background today in, in the program. So if you have questions for either of us, you can add them to the chat. All right, I'd like to welcome Todd. I think you were muted, Todd. Oh, yes, I was. Here we go. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, are you ready for me to get started? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to spend some time today talking about a research program that I've had ongoing for, for many years and, and uh, uh, that's trying to understand the physical limits and timing of water level change that occurs in the upper Great Lakes. And today what I'm gonna do is talk about primarily on Lake Michigan, some work that we've done there. And, uh, and as my fun title, the ins and outs about the ups and downs of, of Lake Bovo in the Lake Michigan Basin. And, and, and I'll be talking more about the entire upper Great Lakes. Um, Polly asked me to talk to everybody about how I've become a geologist. Um, I had no K through 12 earth science um, when I was growing up. Actually, I didn't even go to kindergarten. You had to pay back in those days. Um, I'm the kid, though, that read the encyclopedia. Um, so I always enjoyed just opening up anyone who wanted. I have an early memory of pressing leaves into mud to try to make my own fossils. I, that didn't work out very well, but it was a nice try. Um, I never really collected rocks or fossils. Um, I went to a small college in Northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, Allegheny College, and I knew I wanted to be in the sciences somewhere. And, and so in my freshman year, this was a, a school that had, had, uh, had three terms a year, and I took every course that I possibly could in the sciences. I decided I liked geology, and I never looked back from there and ended up getting a degree from Allegheny College. I came to Indiana University as a graduate student, and here at IU, I received a master's and a PhD. And then I got a job down the hall and up two flights of stairs, which didn't make me have to move very far. And I've worked at the Indiana Geological and Water Survey for 35 years. And in 2015, right at the end of the, end of the year, uh, November 1st, I became the state geologist, which makes me 
um, depending on how you want to count it, either the 15th or 16th state geologist. And if I remember correctly, my first hire after becoming a geologist was hiring a wonderful outreach coordinator who is putting on this pro program today. So what we're going to cover today is uh, a number of different things. We're going to talk about coastal landforms and some of the sediments. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about shoreline behavior, how shorelines behave um, in, in a tidal settings. Um, we're going to be talking about a method of collecting subsurface sediment called vibracoring, uh, some age dating methods, uh, building a paleohydrograph. A hydrograph is anything that shows water levels going up and down. And then we're going to talk about patterns of lake level change over, over the last 6,000 years. So let's start out to say where we are with lake level within, within the Lake Michigan and, and the, the upper Great Lakes a, as a whole. Um, starting in about 2014, lake level started to rise very rapidly in Lake Superior and Lake, lake Michigan basins. Uh, typically, the lakes are low in the winter months, and, and then they rise to a, a peak in the summer months, and then fall again back in, into the winter months. It's an annual cycle that we have. But in 2019, uh, and starting in 2014, and then very dramatically in 2019, there was a significant influ influx of water, and that caused a rapid rise, rise in lake level, um, reaching a point here in, in Lake Michigan where it's setting some, some record highs. It went on to be even higher in 20, 2020. And the main reason for this was that there was considerable quantity of water coming into the basins. We were setting uh, um, more than, you know, in this case, Lake Michigan Huron for October alone, 157% of its normal rainfall that you get for that month. And that just kept the lake levels very high in, in the fall when it would normally be, be falling. And the reason for this is starting in 2014. Now, this is a, this is a, a map uh, centered on, on the North Pole. And if you look down here, this is the Florida and down in, into Mexico. Starting in about 2014, we consi consistently had a whole series of, of low pressure systems that came out from uh, Colorado lows, they're sometimes called, that worked their way up in toward uh, Indiana and up to the Great Lakes. And these, these uh, Colorado lows dropped uh, large quantities of water onto the Great Lakes and caused a very rapid water level, water level rise. <clears throat> this shows uh, that rapid rise starting in 2014 up to 2019. It continued higher even in, in the, into 2020. But that's, but that's been following a long-term pattern. So we have been seeing increasing precipitation over the last 100 years um, in the Great Lakes. Um, and that's not uncommon in, in, uh, <clears throat> for us to have these highs and lows time periods where there's significant water uh, that come into the basin. So how does that represent itself in lake level? So this is a this is a, a historical record starting in about 1890 um, and elevation on on this axis meters here over on the other side and we can see starting in 2014 the lake level rose very very rapidly over over the next six years uh, reaching this this new record high for this last century um, in in 2020. Um, when you have high lake levels like this, uh, you know, rises and falls, people often ask, well, why does it happen? And is there any systematic pattern to it? And the one way to, to do that is try to get all the data that you can actually find. And we have more data than this data, these data that you can see from, from 1890. We have data that goes clear back to the early 1800s. And what we can show from earlier Corps of Engineers data, as well as data that is in the congressional record, is that lake levels in the late 1800s were systematically higher, consistently higher than what we, we see, see today. Um, but then they fell to a low during the Dust Bowl days of the 1930s. And then we've been have rises and falls ever since uh, in, throughout that time. And again, the question comes back is that when we see these rapid rises and falls, is there a systematic pattern to, to these? And so one way to do that is to actually take the data and do a spectral analysis. So essentially what we're gonna do is look at the data to see is there any cycles, any frequency of rises and fall in lake level that we can see. And there are quite a number of different ways to do a spectral analysis. Here's one that's known as a Horn Valley Unis spectral analysis. So you have years down at the bottom, a normalized power with one being the more, more common of, of the, the frequencies you would see. And in this case, on this chart at one year, there's a rise and fall and I used monthly data when I did this spectral analysis. And this shows the annual rise and fall uh, of lake level in, in the Lake Michigan Basin. And then there's some peaks that come out. And there's a, there's a double peak here sitting at about eight years that suggests that maybe there's some kind of trend with, within the, the data uh, around eight years. Another one here around 11. 
Um, we pick up one here around 14. We get another one around 16. That's not uncommon. And if you get a pattern around eight, it'll duplicate itself, um, you know, a, a double, double itself later, later on. But what I really want to talk about is that this really, really large peak that we see here around 30 and 30, 31 years. And it's suggesting that within the data, there is some kind of frequency that occurs, a quasi-periodic behavior, if you will, that occurs somewhere around 30 years. Well, here's the problem. Because of the length of our data set, um, these data are only statistically valid out to about 12 years. So these other peaks that we end up seeing, they're not statistically valid. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are they real? So they might not be statistically valid, but they might be real. And our problem is that we just don't have a long enough data set with only having 200 years. So what we need to do is to take um, our, our historical record and move it back into geologic time. So that's our first question that we might have here. Why do we need to study the geologic record? And I had just really commented about that, that, that what we have is too short a record to see any systematic patterns within our data. So what we need to do is get a longer record and move it back into geologic time. So what do we have? If we're gonna to try to take our historical record, what do we have in our geologic record that we can work with? And we're very lucky within the, the upper Great Lakes is that we have um, many parts of the upper Great Lakes where where there are these black lines that you can see. This is Northern Indiana. This is a map. This is Gary sitting in here. The yellow is known as the Tolleson Beach. It's a geomorphic feature. And internally within it are these formal relic shorelines known as beach ridges. And on this, this uh, map that I made many years ago, there's a lot of gaps, but these ridges at one time continued across, but now because of urbanization and industrialization, uh, they've been knocked down and, 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 and plowed over in, in many places. Let's look at that a little bit closer. Here's a photograph from 1938. Um, the Gary Airport sits right here in the middle and each one of these little white lines is, is a formal relic shoreline of Lake Michigan. And you can see that they've systematically added these lines um, up to, to today. Now, with all of the urbanization, um, this is what it looked like in 1998. And of course, now by, by 2018 with this diagram, there's not a lot of the, these beach ridges that are, you can still go, go see that have been, been plowed over. But each of the, each of the white lines is, is a former position of the shoreline through time. And the black that's in between them is a wetland that existed in, in between each one. And as I said, these occur all over the place. This map shows, shows embayments to Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, and, and Lake Huron, where uh, there were 10 or more beach ridges. And just to show an example of them, this is Manistique, Michigan. Here's some of the relic shorelines. This is from an oblique aerial photograph. The older shorelines here in the landward part, and we've been systematically adding them on to, to, uh, to uh, the coastline up there at Manistique, Michigan uh, for quite a long period of time. Uh, the photograph down at the bottom comes from Grand Traverse Bay on the Keweenaw Peninsula. And this is one of my favorite photographs. Um, we had, we had studied this area and um, they came in a year after we had done our work and they had, they had timbered it and they left the rack laying around and it caught on fire and then burned it off. But that really gave us a wonderful chance to, to show what these beach ridges look like down on the ground. And if you look way in the back here, there's a, there's a ridge and then there's another one and another one and I'm standing on one and then there's another one and then there's another one. And the way these form is that the shoreline was here as lake level fell, the shoreline prograded some somewhere out into the lake. And then as lake level began to rise again, it eroded landward and vertically aggraded and made a ridge. And so what we're having is a systematic pattern of making ridge after ridge after ridge as we add them onto the lake. And so each one of these relic shorelines records a high stand in the lake. And in this case, a high stand in Lake Superior. And in this case, a high stand in, in Lake, lake Michigan. Um, so what we would like to do is go to those, those shorelines and ask them two very simple questions. You know, how old are you? And what was the elevation of the lake when you formed? And those are two very simple questions, but they're also very difficult to get the information. Um, if we want to try to get the elevation of the lake when, when the beach ridge formed, we have a wonderful relationship that occurs in, in the Great Lakes is that, that uh, waves drive the coarsest grain material on shore. And what they do is they concentrate it in an area that's called the plunge point. So we have these gravelly material right where lake level was 
and then it gets finer grained offshore as well as it gets finer grained onshore. So if we dig into each one of the beach ridges and get down far enough to where we can find th these gravity material, then we know what the elevation of the lake was when that ridge formed. Well, that's hard to do um, because most of these areas are in very remote, as you can see in this, this diagram. Um, also, the water table is often there. And once you get down to the water table, you can't dig much farther. So in our case, what we've used is a coring device called a vibracor. And it simply uses a concrete vibrator. And the concrete vibrator is pulled through concrete to settle it when you're pouring a foundation. And it hooks onto a five horsepower engine. We've strapped it onto a piece of aluminum irrigation pipe and we turn it on and it vibrates. And what it does is it liquefies the sediment underneath the ground and it goes in about the rate that you can see my pointer is, is, is going into the ground. And so we'll sink this tube in. Um, we generally need to go about 10 or 15 feet, feet into, into the ground like that. Well, that's the easy part. The hard part is actually getting the tube back out of the ground. And so in that case, we hook some come alongs on, we can pull about eight tons and we physically jack this core out of the ground. And then we tape both of the ends up and get ready to take it out. And even though the jacking it out of the ground sounds like the hard part, the hard part is really this, having to lug it out of the area. So this is my long-term colleague, Steve, ba Steve Badke at uh, James Madison University. This is around an 11 foot core. It's around 10 pounds per foot. So that's a 110 pound, pound core. So typically your day, you start out with a nice clean shirt like this. And by the end of the day, you have this sweat covered and dirty shirt as you get somewhere between uh, three to six be beach ridges today. Uh, each day with, with them. So what we're doing now is is um, is taking this core back into the laboratory. And once we take it back into the laboratory, um, so let, let me just recover that or remind you just a little bit. We're setting up along the lakeward margin of, of each beach ridge and we're drilling down to try to find these material right here, this coarse grain material where, where the lake level was when, when it formed. If we opened up that core, we, normally we have a finer grain material at the top, which is the dune cap that we see here on the top of the ridge. And then we go down into coarser grain material um, that, that is part of the swash zone of the beach and the geologists call that the foreshore. And at the very bottom of, of the foreshore is that coarse grain plunge point material. And then the grain size drops back behind that into a lower values um, as part of the upper shore face. There's occasional gravels and other things in there, but usually this plunge point is, is, is very easy to pick. And if I show you an example of it, here's a grain size analysis from Northern Indiana from Miller Woods. Um, this is the mean grain size. Here's the dune. Here we get into the swash zone of the sediments and you can see the coarse grain plunge point down here at around a little more than, than three, three meters down. So if we collect the vibracore along the lakeward margin of a ridge, um, we then survey in very accurately the elevation of, of the ground surface and we measure down from that ground surface to this point. We'll know the elevation of the lake when, when, the, when uh, that beach ridge formed. Getting the age is a little more difficult and we've used two different methods uh, to determine the age, age of the ridges. Um, in this case, there's a beach ridge here inside of, of, of these, uh, these cedars that you can see in, in spruces behind us. And there's another beach ridge uh, off to the picture here to, to the left. And uh, my other long-term colleague, John Johnston is probing uh, the wetland in between those two ridges to try to, to, try to find the deepest part of, of the wetland. And what we'd like to do is then hand auger that and then pull some organic material out from the bottom of it and date it. And what we're doing is making the assumption that this is toward the lake. So this is a younger beach ridge. There's an older beach ridge here to off to the left. And this wetland could not have been here until that beach ridge formed. And so what we're arguing is that the, or, the age of the wetland sediments that have accumulated at the bottom of the ridge should give us a close approximation to the ridge lakeward from it. Um, and that, that works and it worked pretty well and we were able to use it. But then a newer technique came along called optically stimulated luminescence. And op optically stimulated luminescence allows us to actually date the, the quartz grains themselves or the last time that they saw sunlight. And so what we do in that case is get up onto the top of the ridge and we dig a deep hole down into it until we get into, you can see this darker grain material, which is the swash zone sediments or part of the foreshore. And we collect these cans of sediment and we bring this back to the laboratory and we determine the age of when those grains um, actually last saw sunlight. And it's a, it's a wonderful technique. Um, here at the survey, I think we're one of 13 labs in the country that, that can do, do this technique. And it really opens up um, our ability to, to explore um, uh, these uh, coastal sediments. 
So here's some questions for us to look at. Why, first of all, do we study beach ridges? And the answer to this one is that the beach ridges are a record of lake level change through time. They record high stands in lake levels. So if we study each one of those ridges, we and we and uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, understand something about the upper limit of lake level thermal so time. So what two pieces of information do we need to obtain from the study of beach ridges? So what we want to do is go to each beach ridge and determine the elevation of the lake when the ridge formed. At, at its high stand, and then also the age, age of the ridge when it formed. Why do we vibracore? We vibracore so that we can get down inside the beach ridge and pull up that coarse grain material at the base of the foreshore, the plunge point material, so it'll tell us where the age of the lake, or where the elevation, I'm sorry, of the lake is. The, the lake was when the beach ridge formed. And what methods do we use to determine the age of the ridges? We've used two, radiocarbon dating the wetland sediments between ridges, and also doing optically stimulated age determinations of each ridge itself. So let's do that. Let's go to a, a site. This is uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes, um, the, the southern unit, the Platte Lake unit of, of Sleeping Bear Dunes. And so this would be just about at the, the tip of your little finger on, on your left hand. And the black lines are showing each of the individual beach ridges that occurs within that area. Um, the ridges started to form sometime in the past and closed off Long Lake and Rush Lake from Lake, Lake Michigan, and then continued to add ridges on and on and on up to about right here. And then it stopped making beach ridges and it started making a large dune ridge. And the main reason for that is that we'd actually prograded far enough out into the lake that there was no longer any space to make a ridge. You can see they're very recurved here and they become very straight as we move toward the lake. So at each one of these black dots, we've collected a vibracore. This is very strenuous work. And we didn't collect any vibracores in here because it was a cedar swamp that was so dense we could not even get through it. But we went around it and came and, and finished collecting up some beach ridges. So if we measure distance landward along, along uh, this transect, and we then make a, a plot of that. So we have distance landward, and then we have elevation. And what this is, is the upper and lower limit. Sorry, this is the upper and lower limit of each one of the beach ridges. So that beach ridge right there is this first dot. And the beach ridge right here is the last dot down here in the back part of it. And so what we show is that lake level was high back when Long Lake and Rush Lake were being captured off from, from Lake Michigan. And then it fell to a low here about 2,500 meters landward and then rose to another high with these shorter term rises and falls within it. And then by roughly 800 years ago, stopped making beach ridges and turned over into making a large dune ridge. What we'd like to know is what are the ages of these? And so in our case, we used radiocarbon dating at, at this place. I, I wish we would have had it OSL at that time. But what we, we've, these are our radiocarbon dates um, going, going landward. And what, we'd like, what we've done is because we cannot, you know, because there's variability as well as we cannot date every, every wetland, uh, financially, we cannot date every, every wetland. Uh, what we do is create an age model. And so in our case, we've made a, a linear regression through the data and at every distance landward, then we have an age. So any beach ridge that might be at 3,000 meters landward, we would come over and say that its age would be roughly 23, 2400 100 years old. Uh, we can also change this, this distance landward and just put the ridge number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 10 uh, on here. And now when we, when we do the regression, we're getting an age per ridge. And when we do that, it says that the age per ridge in this area was roughly around 32 years per ridge. So we're building a ridge here in, in Sleeping Bear Dunes about every 30, 32 years. So if we take the, this age model and we then plot the data, the distance data on top of it, we end up getting a hydrograph. And so this is a hydrograph just for, for the Platte Lake unit that shows that lake level was high here around 2,800 years ago, fell to a low here around 2,100, something like that, rose to another high, but also, and, and then stopped making beach ridges around uh, 1,200 years ago. And so we can see that there are systematic pa patterns. It's an interesting pattern where there's 
four to six ridges making sort of groups of ridges, ridges too. So what we wanna do is because not every site, in this case, obviously we don't have any data from 1200 to the present and we don't go much older. I know we can go back to about 6,000 years. We wanna to go to multiple sites within the Lake Michigan Basin so that we can build a hydrograph of, of the record of water level change through, through time. And so this is just showing uh, Lake Michigan. Well, obviously we worked in the, the Tallston Beach in Northern Indiana. This is the Platte Lake data that I just showed you. Bailey's Harbor over in the Door Peninsula, Manistique, Michigan, where I showed that aerial photograph earlier. And then over here, Wilderness State, State Park up by this, the Straits of Mackinac. And this is, this is the, the hydrographs we put together for each one of those sites. And, uh, it, you know, you start to see that peaks do match on them, but the, one of the questions that you end up having is why aren't these data all on top of each other? If a beach ridge at 2000 years ago formed here in the Tolleston Beach and at Platte Lake and at Bailey's Harbor and at Manistique and Wilderness, the lake level was all the same at all of those sites. Why, when I put my hydrograph together, are the data um, not on top of each other? They should be right on top of each other. And there's really a simple explanation, uh, explanation for that is that the ground in the lake, in the upper Great Lakes throughout the entire Great Lakes is actually not stable. It's warping because the ice had depressed the crust up here in the northern up in the Hudson Bay area. Now that we've taken that weight of ice off of our basin roughly 8,000 years ago, the ground surface is popping back up. So it'd be similar to putting your finger on a cork in, in a glass of water. You take your finger off and the cork pops back, pops back up. The earth is doing that too, but it does it at a much slow, slower rate. Um, and, and so we need to now take that rebound out of our data and, um, and, and collapse them all down. Well, all of our data is relative to the outlet at Port Huron. This is where all the water goes out. So all of Lake Michigan's water joins Lake Huron and goes out through here. So what we wanna do is build a hydrograph that runs right through the Port Huron outlet. So all of the ground surfaces here where this this zero line hit are all essentially moving at the same amount. Um, sites to the northeast of this are rebounding more rapidly than the outlet and sites to the southwest are actually rebounding less rapidly and in a sense are debounding. Um, if, if we come over to this graph and we see that the red line is what lake level did at the Port Huron outlet, um, so this is, we're, this is just a, a schematic diagram, if we build a beach ridge right here um, at the Port Yarn Outlet um, to the north, it will be rebounded through time. And then maybe a site farther north will be farther rebounded so time. So let's look at look it up here at, at the, the Sioux, Sioux Outlet. That's 18, I believe this is 18 plus three, that'd be 21 uh, centimeters per century. So every 100 years, uh, that beach ridge has lifted itself up 21 centimeters higher than the beach ridge that was formed down here at the Port, Port Huron Outlet. Um, and so what we want to do is remove all that. And when we, when we, um, then we can collapse all of those hydrographs back together and we'll have one lake level hydrograph for the entire uh, Lake Michigan and Huron Basin together. So here's a couple questions. Um, you know, why do we do the linear regression through the dates? We do that to make an age model because we don't have an age and we have variability within our data and we don't have an age for every one of the beach ridges. We wanna build an age model so that at any distance landward or at any number ridge landward, um, we would know the age of, of that ridge. And then the next question is, why do we need to remove the glacial isostatic rebound? Um, we need to remove that so that we can collapse those back down on top of each other and produce one individual hydrograph for, for the basin. So what did we, we figure out? Um, we've done this in, in all three lakes, but I'm only gonna talk about Lake, Lake Michigan right now. We built this hydrograph. And so let me explain it just a second. This is, this is calendar years on the bottom and it's calendar years before 1950. And, and most geologists use 1950 as zero instead of using an ADBC zero because in 1949 is when radiocarbon dating came out and somebody needed to have a date you know, that you need to make, it's called zero, and everybody calibrates all of their ages to being at, at 1950. It's easier to talk about years ago than to talk about ADBC. On this axis is elevation. On one side, it's meters, and on the other side, side it's feet. And so we're getting older in time in this direction, 
And we have data that goes back to about 6,100 years and we can show that lake level was rapidly rising. Um, it reached the, the elevation of the modern lake of, of Lake Michigan Huron, you know, probably here around uh, 6,300 years ago and continued to rise to a peak at 4,500 years ago, uh, an all time high lake level, some six meters higher than when lake level is today. And that's been called the Nipissing phase of ancestral Lake Michigan. After reaching that height, it quickly took a, a rapid fall of around four and a half meters over the next 500 uh, to 800 years. Um, and then it had time periods where it was higher, time periods it was lower um, through that, for, uh, through the time coming up to the, to the modern record here. And this is the historical record um, from, from the late 1800s uh, into the current, current time. Um, also pervasive within these data are these rises and falls um, within it and the upper, what we measured was the red, the, the blue is, is, a, is an estimated uh, inferred lower elevation because we don't collect any data on how low it went. So we only know that, that it's high. And um, so this is that, the, this is a, a, a longer term behavior that it's occurring within the lake. And it's a 160 year behavior um, that we've been able to recognize. And internally within that, we can't show each individual beach ridge but this is a little diagram which show that the lake level would rise up to the peak and we'd have a high stand in, in, in lake level for e each one of the beach ridges. So you generally get four to six beach ridges that defines a 160 year behavior. And we can take that 160 year behavior and we can run it right into the historical record. And if we then let's move into the historical record and show you what we have. Here's, here we're coming out of the geologic record Here's the high lake levels in, in the 1930s, the low lake levels, in, I'm sorry, in the late 1800s, the low lake levels in the 1930s, and then the rising lake level. This gets pulled down a little bit here uh, because of this, this long-term period and we don't have any more high lake levels, but eventually this, this green line will, will come up, this moving line. Internally within it, this is the 30-year behavior shown by, by this 30-year uh, uh, smoothing of, of our data like that. So we have two quasi-periodic behaviors within the, the uh, Lake Michigan Basin, one of them around 160 years and one of them around 30 years. And what's happening right now is that we are peaking on a 30-year and we are peaking on a 160-year uh, behavior. So we're, we're having uh, one fluctuation riding along on the back of the other one, and we're, we're joining them together to, an, uh, to a very extreme, extreme high lake level. Um, I just wanted to show you some other sites uh, that, that we've worked. I've already talked about, about um, the Tolleston Beach, but I wanted to point out one thing about the Tolleston Beach. You look at, this is the Grand Calumet River here. And these are individual beach ridges. And notice that they recurve back to the, the river. And what they're showing is the mouth of the river through time. So when this beach ridge was here, the mouth of the Grand Calumet River was right here. And as we added another beach ridge, we shifted the mouth farther and farther to the east. Over the last 2,600 years, the mouth of the Grand Calumet River has, has shifted 22 kilometers across the northern coast of, of Indiana very dramatic, uh, rapid change in, in the mouth of a river. Uh, this is St. This is Vitals Bay at the very tip of, of the Upper Peninsula. All those green dots show where we've, we've collected uh, Viber cores. This is uh, Batchewana Bay up in, in Lake Superior. Uh, we've worked on, on the shorelines there. This is a bluff that was formed during the, the Nipissing High, but over here it ended up making individual beach ridges and captured this lake off from, from the Lake Superior Basin. This is one of my favorite sites. This is, this is uh, Autrain Bay in, in Lake Superior. And I wanna come over to the very edge of it. This is a bedrock upland area and a lot of water comes out of, of that upland. It's a sand, sandstone upland and it, it floods the, the wetlands on this side. And what it illustrates for us is, is both the, the 30 year and the 160 year behavior. The wider than normal wetlands are the, the, the in between each one of the 160 year behaviors. And so if we start counting, here's a wider wetland, one, two, three, four, five ridges. And then we count one, two, three, four, um, maybe five in there, five ridges, one, two, three, four, five. So this is the groups of ridges uh, representing these 160 year behaviors with each of the individual beach ridges being the individual dots on, on, on the hydrograph. Um, why? 
you know, is one of the questions and what's driving this? Well, one of the things we know is that, that on, up on our hydrograph is cold and wet weather and down on our hydrograph is warm and, warm and dry. So um, what we can really say with this is that, that we actually, not only do we have a, a hydrograph, but we may have a climate record itself too. And so I've just put some other, other kind of uh, uh, um, different reference systems that people have used um, on this graph. Uh, this is one that's often done by, by the archeologists. They have an early, um, middle and late woodland periods. And it's interesting that, that independently they divided their, their data set into things that are, are broken up uh, on a cool period between the middle and, and late woodlands. Um, and then the end of the, the woodlands during this warm, warm period at the exact same time that all the Mayan droughts were going on and the Mayan communities collapsed. One of the ones that I thought was kind of interesting is that we have these things called sunspot minimums. So we have times when the sun uh, does not have very many sunspots. And at that time, the sun is much cooler or doesn't irradiate as much as, as it normal, that it's normal does. And it's interesting that our high lake levels or our cool wet periods seem to follow exactly on these really well-known sun, sun swap minimums. So it appears as if that maybe there is a climate signal that's actually driven um, by, by some sol solar behavior that, that occurs um, within the upper Great Lakes basins. Okay, it's time for, for our conclusions from, from this talk. Um, so the geologic record is about 25 times longer, but several orders of magnitude greater in sampling interval. And what I mean by that is that we have a, we, we have a record that goes more farther back to about 6,100 years. And um, so we have a long, long geologic record. Our historical record is only about 200 years, but unfortunately within our geologic record, because we're using beach ridges and they form about every 30 years, um, we, we have a very long sampling interval compared with what um, what is done uh, by the Corps of Engineers where they're collecting data every six, six minutes. Um, so there's a very different in order of magnitude of what we're able to determine from the geologic record. Uh, beach ridges are records of high stands in lake level. Um, and so by using them, we can figure out what the upper limit of lake level is through, through time. Um, hydrographs are only relative to the site that they were formed at. And what we have to do is remove um, the, the long-term uh, warping of the basin and collapse them all down so that we can, we can uh, see, see what was uh, observed at the, at the outlet for Lake Michigan Neuron. We have two quasi-periodic fluctuations, one around 30 years and another around 160 years. Um, the 30 years makes each of the individual beach ridges, whereas the 160 year uh, uh, fluctuation produces these groups of ridges like I showed you at, at Autrain and, and at Sleeping Bear Dunes. There may be even a longer term fluctuation around 1500 years that's represented by the very peaks of the, the large phases uh, that, that we have within the lakes. And so those are some of the things that we've learned about, about the upper lakes. And then I wanna thank everybody for listening. Thanks, Todd. All right, I have a couple of questions for you if you're able to stop sharing your screen. Um, if anybody who is watching the live program has questions, you can go ahead and add them to the chat. But I have a couple of questions that came in online before the program um, on some of our social media pages. Um, the first one, what kind of geologist would you say that you are and how much math do you use? You certainly showed a lot of math in the program today. <laughs> Um, so I am, I am a sedimentologist. I study both uh, modern and ancient sediments. Um, and so um, I, I work from the rock record and I also work in, into the, the unconsolidated record. Um, most sedimentologists are very good observational scientists. Um, you, you get very good at recognizing bed forms, getting recognizing patterns within your data, um, both geomorphic patterns as well as sedimentologic patterns. And, and, and pulling those out and collecting some type of, of, of data that you need there. Um, I'm, I'm actually not a, a big statistician. I mean, I'm using fairly simple models um, to, to work through our data. I mean, most of the, the, um, the packages that do spectral analysis as well as, as other regression kind of patterns are out there and, and I employ those. I understand what they mean, but I'm not actually writing the code that, that does those, those um, those regressions or those analyses. All right. Um, 
you mentioned that there are there's a systematic pattern to the beach ridges forming at high points every 30 um, years or so. Uh, do you think that people will change that timing? Um, and that's a that's a very good good question. Um, we've been seeing this pattern going on for roughly 6,100 years, and I can actually go into older shorelines back 1,300 year 13,000 years ago, and I actually see systematic development of of, of ridges back then too. Um, so I think these are long term patterns um, that that are continuing on within our system. Um, with all of the climate change that's been going on here over the last 50 some years. Um, it appears as if this 30 year behavior is right on on schedule. Um, it's, it's still continuing on. It's, it's some larger, large scale uh, kind of climatic behavior that's occurring within uh, global circulation patterns. And uh, I don't really expect it to stop. I mean, that would be that'd be a tough one. OK, um, what would what would make your model more accurate? What kind of information would make your your model more accurate? Um, more sites, and and I've only shown I've only shown five sites, but we've actually then went on and did fifteen sites up in Lake Superior, um, and we went on and did uh, I'm sorry five sites up in Lake Superior and another five sites in in Lake Huron. Um, I have other colleagues that have added data onto our data set, um, and so we have a fairly robust, very uh, large and long term long term uh, data set that that we're joining together to to understand it better. The one thing that ha is making our data much better was moving away from using the radiocarbon dates um, to moving to using the OSL where instead of dating some relationship to the beach ridges, which we had to do with the wetland, we're now dating the ridge itself. OK, and I have one last question. Um, as the beach ridges form through time, they get they prograde towards the modern day shore. You showed that. Um, will the beach ridges eventually fill in Lake Michigan? Um, for the beach ridges generally occur within embayments in, in, in the lake. And, um, and after that, that drop in fall from the peak Nipissing between 4,500 and around 3,500 years ago, many of the embayments around the lake have been filling in. And slowly but surely, they fill in all of those abatements because every shoreline wants to be straight. If you have a promontory, promontories are going to be eroded by the waves. And if you have an embayment, sediment's going to accumulate in that embayment. So we're not going to fill in the entire lake, but we will straighten out the shorelines. And in many shorelines, um, such as Sleeping Bear Dunes, we're no longer making beach ridges there because we've essentially straightened the shoreline and there's no accommodation space inside of the abatement to have that beach ridge there. But no, we're not going to fill in the entire lake. It would take a lot more sediment to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering these questions. I think that's all of the questions that we have, yes. Um, and you've done a really excellent job at explaining how your research has helped to kind of solve what's going on now and, and comparing the modern record to the geologic record. Um, Again, if anyone has any further questions, if they watch this recording, please let us know and we will answer them online. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, uh, let us know. We are all ears and we look forward to seeing you at the next episode of Dig Deeper in July. All right. Thank you very much, Todd. You're welcome. And we'll end the program now. Goodbye, everyone.